Good morning, Community of Hope. So glad you are here this morning. Um, I have a couple things I want to talk about on the front end that's happening in the life of the church, um, and we don't want you guys to miss it. Um, so the first thing we want to talk about is we have some exciting news. We are going to transition back into Sunday schools. So I need you to keep this date into mind, August 15th. We will actually change our service time back to 930. So don't show up at 10 on the 15th. You'll be late, really late. Um, so we're going to start back at 930, and then Sunday school will follow. Um, our teachers are super excited about getting back together, and then I think we have some opportunities to have some new classes that might be starting this fall. So mark your calendars. Until then, it can be 10 o'clock, but just remember the 15th, we're going to start back at 930 so that you guys can go to Sunday school afterwards. Um, also wanted to remind you there will be a membership class on that day. We've had a few people that um, are interested in either joining the church or maybe just learning more about what a Nazarene is and what it means to be, a, what it means to follow Christ in our denomination. So we will have a class that day. I'll give you more details as that gets closer. Also, another reminder, Wednesday nights, we will keep that same format. Um, even once we start back um, on the 15th, we'll still have things for the kids. The youth will still be meeting in the youth center. Um, the adults will be in the loft at 630. And then in here, we will still do our family open gym where you can bring your whole family. They're going to play games. It's a fun time of fellowship. And I've heard, I've heard that Pastor Ed and Pastor Jeremy make a mean slushie. So if you don't come but for anything for that, come for the slushies. Um, we still have another week of VBS coming up at the end of this month. Um, the last week in July, Monday through Thursday, and I do believe it's a daytime VBS for those who would like to bring their kids. If you need more information, it's on the Welcome Center, or you can come see any staff member, and we can get you signed up and ready to go for that. Um, it's 80s theme, so I don't know why anybody would want to miss that. Um, and then uh, last thing is, one of the last things, we would like for you all to stand and turn and greet your neighbor and say good morning. As we're greeting one another and saying good morning, I almost forgot the connection books are on your end of your rows and on the tables. We'd love to know that you're here and we can pray for you guys, so don't forget to fill those out on your way. And as we gather back in, I would like for us all to recite the Apostles' Creed together. So if we can all in unison recite this together. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended to hell. Third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning, community of hope. Put your hands together.
some clap of praise for he is worthy, amen, for he is good this morning. Let's just get ready to worship him. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in his love. First John 1930. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Lord, thank you for giving yourself for us, Lord, for sacrificing yourself so that we may live. Worship with us this morning.
Lord, we just welcome you in this place. Lord, you are so holy. Thank you, Lord.
that he is for you. He is for you. He longs to be gracious to you. Jay mentioned that verse of scripture that says, if God be for us, who can be against us? It's a powerful truth. But I was thinking in just that moment as he shared that with us, that the one person that can be against us that can ruin it all is ourselves. He longs to be gracious to us. He longs to be good to us. He longs to lead us to green pastures and cool waters. Sometimes in our stubbornness and resistance and our own plans, we don't, we don't get there. We stand in the way sometimes of his best for us. Oh, I don't want that to happen in your life today or any other day. I want you to experience the goodness of God every day of your life and Experience his graciousness in your life. It's just a matter of saying, uh, rather than saying, God, bless my plans and me in them as I pursue them, no matter what you want. It's a matter of saying, Lord, be Lord of all, of all things in my life. May my plans be your plans. Your plans be my plans. May you be my Lord. May you be my guide. You take me to those places you know are best for me, and I'll follow you. Are you ready to do that in your life and experience the, the goodness and the graciousness of God? I know there's a lot of needs in this church family, and I know the Lord wants to minister to every one of those needs. I know He wants to encourage your heart and inspire you and bring good out of all the troubles and struggles that you face in your life. If there's a special need that you have for prayer today, would you just lift your hand and say, Pastor, there's a need I have in my life want you to pray about it. You don't have to tell us what it is. The Lord knows what it is. We're going to pray about that today. I just want you to find a posture of prayer. You're welcome to be seated. You're welcome to remain standing. You're welcome to come use an altar if you'd like. And if you'd like to have someone come and pray with you, just lift up your hand and, and please pay attention, staff especially, as people might come to the altar today and need some help with praying. Let's, let's seek the Lord in prayer this morning. Father God, we want to thank you so much for the fact that you are gracious to us, that you seek to bless us, that you are for us, not against us, that you are with us in our comings and our goings, that Lord, uh, your presence longs to be, be manifest in our lives, your power and your healing and your strength, and your encouragement, and your inspiration. Lord, we're so grateful for the fact that you are constantly at work in us for our absolute best. Even, Lord, when we stubbornly resist you and seek our own ways, you continue to work to bring us to a place, Lord, where we recognize that your ways are higher than our ways and better than our ways. Your plans for us are greater than anything we could possibly imagine. You have wonderful plans for us. You want to include us in your great mission. You want to use us in your great cause. You want to do wonderful things in our families. You want to see uh, the, uh, the, the love that we have for you and, and the experience we have with you to be passed to the next generation, the next generation, so that those of us as we age are able to look at our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and see, Lord, the work of God in them as we've experienced it in us. And know, Father, that as, uh, as we leave them to live in this world in the kinds of cultures that they'll deal with and issues they'll struggle with, you know, they'll have a solid and firm foundation for the Lord. Lord, I know that you're very aware of all the needs in this church family today. I know that you understand every heartache and every burden, and every struggle, every question and every doubt. Lord, I know that you are more than able to sufficiently provide for each one of our needs. Lord, we don't understand everything, but we trust you. We know you've got it all under control. We know you're very aware of everything and are working, Lord, in ways that we couldn't even imagine. Lord, those that lifted their hands requesting special prayer, I 
pray. Uh, I pray that you'd encourage them right now. The knowledge that you're moving in their lives and working in their request. And it may not work out the way they expected, but Lord, they can trust you to work it out in a way that's best. Lord, if there are people here today with hungry hearts that that are still living in darkness or the bondage to sin that we've sung about today. Lord, may this be a day of freedom, a day that we can let go of, of the things that have been holding us back and let you do your wonderful work in us. Lord, continue to fill us with your spirit, fill us with your love. Help us to love each other better than we ever have before and to show your love to the world in such a way, Lord, that, that it... Uh, it causes them to see you differently than their preconceived notions and ideas. I pray, Lord, that we would not reinforce those things about you that the world so see, seems to dislike. Help us, Lord, to, uh, to surprise them with the reality of who you are by the way that we love them and care about them. Lord, you mean everything to us today. You mean absolutely everything to us today. We worship you in true sincerity and in truth. Lord, we pray your anointing on everything that happens from this point forward. Please anoint our pastor as he preaches to us today. May the words that he shares come from your heart, be inspired by your spirit, be interpreted in our heart by your spirit in ways that transform our lives. We love you so very much. We pray all these things now in the wonderful and matchless name of that one who taught us to pray this great prayer. Brothers and sisters, join me please as we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God is good, isn't he? He is worthy to be praised. And that's why we're here today. We gather in this place to worship him, to, to say, God, thank you for, for the mighty things that you have uh, done for me in my life, for the things that, that you not only have done, but will continue to do both in the present and the future. And as we continue our worship, uh, this is an opportunity for us to give back and a way to say to God, what we know, the way, what we have, what we've been given, that we've just been entrusted it. It's not ours. We didn't earn it all on our own. We have been given these gifts of finances and health and, and all that through God. And uh, our giving is a way to say, God, this is yours, and I'm returning a portion of what you've entrusted to me. And this morning as we continue our worship, there are opportunities to give. And uh, you can see them on the screen. You can give online. You can give through the website. There's a texting option. Um, but more so than that, there's also opportunities to give through our times and talents. And yesterday was a great opportunity for us as a church to gather together. I, I don't know how many people were here, but uh, we were here for hours cleaning and straightening and painting and fixing and replacing and doing all the things that that uh, it need. we need to continue in a facility like this and continue to do the ministry that God has called us to do. And so uh, thank you for your generosity, not just in finances, but through your time. And so this morning, as we continue to worship, as the band begins to play here, if you'd like to give, you're welcome to do that. There are buckets here on the stage in the back where you can give online. Let's worship. Let's stand together. Will you stand with us? This is an old worship song. I'm trading my song.
this morning. What an incredible time we've had already in worship, and the, the real question is, God, have you been impressed with our worship this morning? God, have you been pleased with our worship this morning? Did we just come to repeat words on a screen and get inspired and encouraged, or did we truly worship you, and were you pleased by our worship this morning? I pray that that's a testimony for you today, to walk away and say, God, I gave you my heart, I gave you my all. I didn't just come to sing songs and to be entertained. This is not an arena of entertainment. This is a place I give my heart, my life, my all to you. And so if you came for any other reason this morning, I pray that the Holy Spirit himself would, would just enter into your heart and into your mind, into your footsteps, into your hands, into your feet, and everywhere else and consume you this morning as he just helps you understand it's about him. It's not about you. We've been kind of talking about this as we begin small groups and, and Wednesday night Bible studies and different, different things that we're doing. And, and we have some really, really good things happening um, in, in the life of the church right now. There's On Wednesday nights, we have multiple things that you can be plugged into and a part of. And one of the conversations that we constantly have as we're planning for Sunday school to begin August 15th. Mark that in your calendars if you haven't heard that yet. You should have. But if this is the first time, mark your calendar. August 15th, we're going to begin small groups again. And so many of us come to those groups or, or we think, why do I need to be a part of that? I've heard all the preaching. I've heard all the teaching. I've, I can do my devotions at home. I have a small group somewhere else. Well, let me give you one good reason just to contemplate. It's not about you. This isn't a selfish religion. This isn't about being self-centered and about me. What can I get from the situation? What can I retain? What can I have? God will and does speak to you personally and individually. God can speak to you through a Bible study in your own home and should, should be speaking to you every single morning as you open your Bible, every single moment as you're praying and at praying without ceasing. Every time you get in your vehicle and, and, and something inspires the music or, or, or your, your good attitude in traffic inspires you to be more Christ-like, it's not about you. It's about what he's doing through you. It's a, we, here at Community of Hope, we love God and we love people. And so if we love God and we love people, there's nothing in there that says it's about me. It's about him and what he's doing. And so I would like to invite you, I would like to ask you, would you put yourself uh, on the back burner and choose to be a part of a group, maybe not for you, maybe for others? 
Do you know that you encourage and inspire other people to participate? Do you know that when you show up, when, when you're there, when, you are, when your presence, uh, and, and maybe I'm bolstering you a little, but, but when you show up, it makes a difference for somebody else. And I'm more encouraged to be there if you're there. And they're more encouraged to be there if you're there. And so I would ask you, would you just help us? Would you just, would you just come and be a part of, if, if you have the time and you're able and you're available and you, you just somehow believe it might be important for you and for everyone else that we're building the church together in small groups. We're building the church together in here. We love God and we love people, and it's not about us. It's about him and it's about others. And so we want to be a part of that mission and unapologetically be a part of that mission. Today, that kind of it goes along with what we're going to talk about and, and, uh, and what, we have, what, what I have for you today, what I have for you this morning, what the Lord has put on my heart in this series. Um, this, is, this is my favorite series title of all time, uh, the Samuel 17 SummerSlam series. This is inspired by the great, uh, what was the WWF, but now the WWE, many years ago when it was cleaner uh, and it was more appropriate. But I love wrestling, and I still do love wrestling. But we're in a series that is uh, just taken out of 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we have not left the story of David and Goliath. We have, we have, we have stayed in this story. And, and truthfully, we know it as the story of David and Goliath, but we should more understand it and know it as the story of what God did through a servant named David, to a defiant Philistine named Goliath. What he did for a nation and a people, what he chose to do, what one man stood up and chose to do so that God could be glorified. Isn't that what our lives are all about? Standing up so that God can be glorified. It's about him and his kingdom. Remember, it's not about me. It's not about my kingdom. It's not about what I can do. We prayed this morning. We, we first affirmed our faith through the Apostles' Creed that, that we believe in him. It's all about his church. It's all about his spirit. It's all about his, his death and his, his resurrection. It's all about him. We get to be a part of that, and we believe in his holy church, that we are a part of that church. So we're going to continue to talk about that this morning. And I've got, I, I have, I mean, this is the longest I have spent in a chapter in my whole life. And there's so much good that comes out of this chapter. And there's so much practical life application that comes out of this chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 17. We've read it once already. We're not going to read it through again. But I do want to point you to a couple of verses if you'll stand with me this morning. And we can read through this together. 1 Samuel chapter 17 and we'll pick up at verse 40, uh, 51 through 53. And this, is, this takes place after um, David and Goliath have met on the battlefield. And uh, they, the climax of this story, of this particular scene, is about to happen. Uh, David, David throws the stone, and, uh, and, and it hits Goliath right in his forehead, and he just drops like a lead balloon. Verse 51 says this, Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of his sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Then the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the valley and to the gates of Ekron and slain the Philistines. Or, and slain Philistines laid along the way to Sha'arim, even to Gath and Ekron. The sons of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines and plundered their camps. Thank you very much. You may be seated. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is, a, this is a, a, just another fascinating portion of this story. I, I, uh, I have, as I continue to read through this, as I continue to, to, to seek out what God wants for us to hear in this season, in this series, uh, this is one of those places that just kind of jumped out to me in an unbelievable way uh, that, that just was like, I can't miss this. And I recently uh, jumped back on the bandwagon, climbed back on the social media train of Instagram. I, uh, I, I reluctantly did so, but I felt like there was some things that I just, I like pictures and I like stories and I, and, uh, and I don't want to hear a bunch of griping, but I want to see pictures and cool things. And I don't typically follow like myself, like normal people like myself. I want to see like beautiful things and unlike myself, I want to see beautiful 
uh, scenery and, and different things that I don't get to see every single day and just capture some things, some cabins and some mountains and, and uh, ranches and horses and buffalo and all kinds of things that I just I find fascinating. And, and I, so I follow these, these people and I watch these stories and I see these things that, that are taking place. And, and uh, I, I just I get fascinated. And so, so the Lord really brought something to my mind as I was flipping through, as I was kind of scrolling through, looking through Instagram the wonderful time consumer that it is. And I found, this, I found this picture, and I think we have a picture of it, but I found this picture um, on Instagram, and I thought this was a fascinating line. This was, I, I believe that all wisdom, all good things come from God. Everything good comes from God. There's nothing original that, that, that we can, nobody has made anything new up. Everything is, has been, everything's been created. Every, we, we learned that from Ecclesiastes, that there's nothing new under the sun. But I, I, find it, I find it interesting that, there, that the wisdom of God is planted firmly in the midst of Instagram. And on a, uh, on, on, um, uh, many of you have heard of the, of, of the truck series, the King Ranch truck, the Ford that's a King Ranch. Well, this is actually the King Ranch. This is the King Ranch truck comes from the King Ranch ranch. And so this is, uh, this is uh, an Instagram that is, that is King Ranch. This is who, this is them. This is their picture. I think it is. I don't know if that's the same one I saw, but Jay, did you just make that up? That's a good picture. But this is, but this is the line that came from the King Ranch Instagram site. This is the line that came from it, and this is not, they didn't make this up. This isn't something new. This is something that is scriptural and biblical, and and, and it's, it's foundational, and it's something we need to understand. It's important for us as Christian people. This is what it read. Sometimes a commanding presence is all it takes to move the herd. I find that profound. I think that's an incredible line. I just, when I read that, I thought, oh my goodness. That's David and Goliath. That's the Philistines and the Israelites. That's, that's the story of chapter 17 of 1 Samuel uh, and, verse, and, and verse 51 through 53. That, that's what takes place in this story. It just takes, sometimes it just takes someone with a commanding presence uh, to move the herd. It just, somebody has to step up for the herd to move. I worked on a ranch for about uh, two years. And when I say I worked on a ranch, I, I worked on a ranch a couple of days a week for a couple of years, and I really had no idea what I was doing. Uh, most of the time, I was that, like, bottom hand. I was the guy at the very bottom of the pole that, that just did all the jobs nobody else wanted anybody else to do. And so I was the, I was the stall guy. I was the make sure horses get watered. I was the jump on that cow guy. I was wh- whatever they needed, that was me. And so that, that portion of my life just got me fascinated with ranching and farming and all these kind of things. But I understand how cows move, and I understand how herds move. And I began to understand that, that they, just, they won't just move on their own. Well, if they want to move on their own, it's because there's food somewhere else or they've been spooked. They're not going to go where you want them to go automatically. Rhonda, if I'm lying, I'm dying. You know your dad's a rancher, so you understand. Herds go where they want to go unless there's a commanding presence that pushes them where you want them to be. The most difficult place on the ranch when you want them to go through uh, or go somewhere is through a gate. Animals won't go through gates automatically. It's, I don't know if you have any experience with this. This is I have just a couple of years of experience, and so I'm a rookie and a novice. If you know some of this better than I do, you can tell me afterwards or just affirm me publicly. But they just won't go through gates. When they get to a gate, they get scared. They get nervous. And what happens if you begin to push them too hard is they just bolt everywhere. Animals will just bolt everywhere. They don't, they don't automatically just heal to you. But if you know what you're doing, if you have a commanding presence, if you understand how to make the herd move, if you understand how to get things, uh, how to, where to stand, where to, where to place yourself, and, and, and how much pressure to put on, and how much, when to release pressure, all this stuff that makes zero sense to you at all, then you can begin to move the herd. That's why this sentence and this line meant so much to me because I saw it in 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning at verse 51 or 52, after, after David slays the, the giant, after David kills Goliath, there was something in here that just sparked my attention, and there's something in here that should spark our attention this morning that will point us towards what it means to be distinctly Christian as we live our lives for God and God alone. After David kills the Philistines, check this out in verse 52. I mean, it just stuck out to me. And it makes so much more sense when I read something like that. The men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted. 
pursued the Philistines as far as the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the slain Philistines lay along the way to Shaharim, even to Gath and Ekron. The sons of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines and plundering their camp. Remember that they've been hanging out for 40 days and nights? Remember that they've been, they've been on opposing uh, uh, mountainsides or hillsides and they've been shouting at each other or, or pretending to go to battle and as, as Goliath comes out and he stands in the valley and he says, hey, you guys, is there any of you that, that want to just fight me and, and any of you that want to just, just one-on-one take care of this business? We don't have to hang out here any longer. We're, we're wasting provisions. We're wasting, we're wasting time. Our, our wives and our children are at home. There's no reason. We don't have to. You can just imagine as Goliath is taunting all of the men of Israel and, and, the, and the Philistines are laughing and there's no man that's going to come out here. I mean, there's nobody's going to come out here. There, you're not going to get anybody to come out here and fight you, Goliath. We've seen this a hundred times. There's just, there's no chance. As they're hanging out for 40 days and 40 nights, and Saul, even, even Goliath kind of just throws Saul under the bus. Aren't you, aren't you servants of Saul? Aren't you Saul's men? Aren't you the, aren't you the, the group that, that you guys are like powerful warriors, and there's no one among you? Somebody come here for 40 days. For 40 days, they hung out, and they taunted them, and the Israelites heard this. Nobody from that side of the line was willing to come over, and they would act a little inspired every day, and it says the men of Israel would wake up, and they would, they would begin to, to shout, but as soon as Goliath came out, they'd retreat. As soon as Goliath came to the forefront, to the battle line, to the, to the, to the, uh, to the, to the valley, they decided that it was no longer worth showing up for, and so they'd retreat. This is so important for us to understand this morning, church. Because I think each of us, all of us belong to a herd that is willing to, do, is willing to follow. We're all willing to follow something. And, and I, I want to show that to you because, because what happens when David shows up and, 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 uh, and sh- shares his presence and when he kills the Philistine and the, and the army sees something great, there's three things that take place that I think are to be noted this morning. They arise, they shout, and they pursue. But this herd mentality has been taking place for 40 days already. This, this herd mentality, this, this need to follow, this, this, uh, this, this need to belong, this need to be a part has been taking place for 40 days already. And these men were, were already following something, and they were following Saul's presence. They were, they were following the leadership that they were given already. Where David, David's presence caused the army to arise, shout, and pursue, Saul's presence caused the army to sit, be silent, and retreat. Do you see how this is significant? This Go back to that slide if you don't care. Do you see how this slide is significant in understanding that sometimes a commanding presence is all it takes to move the herd? Sometimes it takes just one of us to begin to say, hey, the Lord is doing something in me. And God's doing something in, in me, stirring me. And I, I want to I rise. I want to shout and give him glory. And I want to pursue the things that he wants me to do. There's, there's something that's happening within me. I told my brother yesterday, he, was, he led the, the, the event that took place uh, as, our, as our buildings and ground. Um, uh, uh, what are you? Buildings and ground. Yeah. As he's the leader of the buildings and grounds scenario. And I think many of us walked away in the staff and we just said, that was probably the best, that was probably the best work day we've seen. And how many, I mean, we had, what do you have, 200 people here, Ed? Something like that? Yeah, maybe 50 people here. And it's amazing when, uh, when, when, uh, when you have someone who is pursuing and persisting and, and, uh, and, has, and holds a, a, a clipboard and, and, and you're going to people and you're talking to people and you're sharing with people. And there were many valuable parts and there were many invaluable parts that we couldn't even, we couldn't do this day without, without some of the leadership of Leanne and Chris and some of these others that showed up and the volunteers that showed up. There's no way we could pull off a day like this at all. There's no way that we could do what we had to do, but it took it, it t- sometimes it takes a commanding presence to move the herd. It's, it's, it's okay, we need somebody who's going to say, hey, I need you to sign up here. Hey, I need you to be a part of this. I need you, I need you to put your name on the list, and we're going to give you a T-shirt. That helps bring the herd together. David's presence was commanding. David's presence was about obedience. 
David's presence was about glorifying God. It wasn't about himself. It wasn't about what he thought he could accomplish. It wasn't about his own fears or inadequacy. It wasn't about any of those things. It was about, I want to do the thing that God's telling me to do. I want to accomplish the mission in glorifying God and everything that I do. I, I, I want my presence to count for and be an example of and be, and be used in, and be a vessel for the presence of God in every place that I go. And so, and so David, who who uh, who had been away from this battle, who'd been tending his father's sheep, uh, just listened to his dad, was in the right place at the right time because he was an obedient son and he was being used by God. And so David, his, when his son, when his father says, "Hey, I want you to go to the battlefield. I want you to do run some errands for me. I want you to take this ephah of bread. I want you. To, I want you to take this cheese to the commander. I want to. I want you to give me a report about what's going on." David, being an obedient son, decides he's going to go to the field. He's going to check out what's happening. He's going to. He's going to participate in the. Way Way that his dad asks him to participate, and so just doing the things that he knew he ought to be doing, being obedient, being submissive, plugging in where he knew he needed to plug in, not looking for his own self-centered uh, glory. He was just doing the things that he knew God wanted him to do, and that started with him being an obedient son, loving his father and listening, shows up at the battlefield. And just happens to be in the place at the right time where God had already been working on him and working through him and working with him to kill lions and bears. Oh, my. And he just happened to have the right resources. And he just happened to have the right training. And he just happened to have uh, the right mentality and the right spirit and everything else he needed to inspire a nation to do something incredible. Just understand this for just one second. Goliath is from a a town called Gath. And I find this interesting that that the writer here would would choose to to name the very city that the Israelites chased the, the Philistines to. And slain Philistines lay along the way to Sha'arim, even to Gath all the way to Goliath's hometown. You know who probably got that news when they got there? Goliath's dad. (laughs) Goliath's mom. Goliath's sister. His brothers. All the people who knew him and understood to fear him and understood his position. The inspiration that David caused, that God caused through David's life, that David would just step up in a moment that he would just be available in a moment to do the things that God wanted him to do, that he would be a commanding presence for God in a moment. There began to be be victory, not only from that battlefield, but from that battlefield for God all the way back to the hometown of the giant that he killed. Are you following me on this? It just takes a commanding presence. Sometimes that's all it takes is a commanding presence. Uh, to move the herd, to get the herd moving in the right direction because we are, by nature, I believe we are a people that want to be, uh, we, we want to follow something. We want to get behind something. We want to, we, we're, we're willing to do something because we, we want to we wanna, wanna first believe we're valuable and then second, we want to believe we belong to something. And so uh, you can look at uh, any kind of, um, any kind of herd movement, human movement throughout history and begin to realize that that's true. You begin to look at, for the positive or the negative, you look at revolts. It just took one person or two people or a group of people who are commanding presence that said, hey, uh, this is wrong. What we're dealing with is tyranny. What we're dealing with is is injustice. It's it's unjust. It's not fair. It's not right. And people shouldn't be treated this way. It just takes a commanding presence for someone to say, this has got to stop. And what happens? People begin to rise up. You got to rise up. Sorry, that was funnier in my head. People begin to rise up and begin to believe in themselves because they believe in the leader. They believe in the commanding presence that they're following. They believe in what they're getting behind. If you don't believe me, you can look at the other side of that, the negative side of that, that people feel like uh, there's, there's a, they're, they're all living in turmoil and angst and anger and frustration and, the, and there's no calming voice to tell them to stop and to be calm and th- we're gonna get through this together and so we begin to riot and we begin to uh, cause destruction and we begin to do things negatively. 
because we're so full of passion and we're so full of, of this is wrong and something needs to change, and I'm, but I'm so angry about it. I, don't have, I have a misguided and misdirected understanding of how I should handle this, and so we begin to destroy. It's herd mentality. It's why people come to Jesus so that they can be, believe they're valuable and they belong. It's why people join gangs so that they can be valuable and belong. It just takes a commanding presence to move the herd. And there was two commanding presence at, at this place, on this battlefield, on this day. The commanding presence for 40 straight days caused the army to sit, be silent, and retreat. Church, are you understanding the importance of following the right voices? Do you understand how important it is to follow the right presence? Do you know how significant it is for us to submit ourselves to God and his authority? Because if we don't, the enemy will, will remind us, will, will, will cause us to sit, be silent, and retreat. I believe in the church. All day yesterday and even today as I began to rile up Chrissy Brown, she reminded me, I'm doing this because I love the church. When you're carrying toilets outside that have been used for 20 years, I'm doing this because I love the church. I don't want to touch it, but I'm doing it because I love the church. It's important. It makes a difference. It's helpful for us together. It's helpful for people who walk into our facility. I'm doing this because it's important. Do you know, you know what happened yesterday? Uh, you can look around the whole facility, and you should. You should take some time to go into every single bathroom and stall because all the bathrooms have been just fixed, which has been a huge need for us. Then rooms have been painted, and landscaping has been fixed, and, and we've, got, we've, we've got lights. You can see, Chris, right? We can see in buildings. We think they'll stay on. You know, the last a mouse was in the light fixture uh, sooner than one of us were. I know that because I found it. We have mice checking the lights before we check them. You should look around this beautiful facility that isn't just used for us. It's not about us. But there's all kinds of people that come in and out of our facility. And we take pride in our facility. But you know why we were here? Some of us were here because we, I say we, can I lump myself in the herd, Steve? I'm a plumber if you're the plumber, right? So, so if you actually fix the toilets and the sinks, I can say that. And we had, man, we had an awesome crew of men. I've got some great pictures of, uh, of, of, I don't even know if I should say this, but it's pretty funny in my head, so maybe I should go ahead and, should I say it, Dad? He's saying filter. I'll filter. We don't do this so we can have fancy toilets. We don't do this so that paint just of one room looks nicer. We don't do this just so we can have more storage and we can have a, a, we can have a, a cleaner night to shine room. We don't do this just so that you can have a brighter walk up the stairs or you can look up at the ceiling tile and say, well, those are clean, those are nice. We don't do this just so that we can have a beautiful facility. That's important to us, but it's not the main reason. Glorifying God and loving people is our reason. You know what we got to do yesterday? I got to talk to Tim Durham for, a, a, I don't know how long, he and I got to chat and talk, and as he was coming in and out, and, and I'm not the only one that got to know Tim Durham. Layden Brown got to know Tim Durham yesterday. And it was just beautiful conversation after conversation. As you guys worked, as you guys served, as you guys, you guys did more in the facility than we've done in, the, in, my, in my experience, what we've done here in the last seven years, I know. But it's not about a toilet. It's about glorifying God. It's about, it's about stepping up and being a part of something that isn't just about me. It's about you, God. When Christian people decide that it's not about me, that it's about you, that, that we're going to follow the right authority, that we're going we're gonna to get behind the right thing, we begin to arise, we begin to shout and declare, and we begin to pursue. That's good stuff. You didn't hear that. I'm going to give you one more chance to amen that because that, that's good stuff. When Christian people follow the right authority, when the right commanding presence is, is, when a commanding presence, when any of us decide to step up, 
When any of us choose in our families, in our Sunday school classes, in our workplaces, in our churches, in our world, in any arena, when we begin to stand up and be the people of God that he's called us to be, we begin to arise, we begin to shout, declare God is good, and we begin to pursue. And there's dead bodies from that place all the way back to Ekron. There's dead bodies all the way back to Gath. The enemy knows what took place. The enemy's family knows what took place. The presence of God has been filled in this place and is being declared all over the world. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that a good thing? The enemy wants us to sit, be silent, and retreat. But God is calling us. He's calling each of us individually and specifically and intentionally to arise, shout, declare the name of God, share the war cry, ring the bell. We sing a song in here occasionally. It says, I sing a hallelujah. I want to raise a hallelujah. I want, I want, I want the, my, the flag to be just going straight up the flagpole for people to know, man, God is doing something here and I'm pursuing God, and, and I'm, 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 I'm running the enemy out of town, and it won't exist here in this place. It won't exist in my presence. We, we, a part of our mission statement says we, we, uh, we exist to nurture an environment of spiritual growth for each of us. You know that's an individual charge. This is not just a, a corporate mission statement. It's for each of us to understand that, that we have responsibility to nurture an environment of spiritual growth wherever we go. That our presence should elevate the presence and the environment in which we enter. It's right there. Sometimes a commanding presence is all it takes to move a herd. People want to follow. They want to pursue. They're either going to pursue and follow the things that are good or they're going to sit, be silent, and retreat. Either way, we're going to inspire people one direction or the other. And I'm asking you, church. I'm charging you, church. I'm begging you, church, are we willing to listen to the words of the scriptures and even something we find on Instagram that I believe is wisdom that comes from God because all good things come from God. Nothing, uh, nothing has, has come from God that is not good. All things come from Him. This is great stuff. Are you willing to be somebody who obeys God, who listens to God, and who is willing to be a commanding presence for him so that you can move the herd. I, when we sang that song this morning, The Blessing, I, uh, I still go back to, um, Toby, Chris, you guys will remember this, but, I, man, I, st- I go back to the, to the service we had in Cincinnati last year, I think it was, when I heard this song for the very first time, The Blessing. And every man and women and ch- child in that place was weeping and singing and and, uh, and we were all a part of this great choir of worship. It was an incredible, incredible outpouring of the Holy Spirit and an incredible reaction and response from God's people that we arose, we began to shout, thank you, God. You're so good. He is for you. He is for you. So I got a chance uh, this morning just by dumb luck circumstance, I, I know, Teresa, you don't believe in luck, it wasn't luck, it was God's providence, that, that uh, I was holding Daniel while we were singing that song, and I remember just whispering it to his head, like, he is for you, he is for you, and I couldn't even get through it, I was weeping, he's for you, instead of just singing it out generically, I began to sing it to my son, he's for you, he's for you, he's for you. I realize that I have to be a commanding presence in my son's life. If I want him to understand for generations and your family and your children and their children and their children, am I pointing my herd in the right direction? Are you pointing your herd in the right direction? Do you nurture the environment of, an environment of spiritual growth everywhere you go, in every scenario and every environment in which you live in? Does your presence cause, cause the army, your herd, the people around you to arise, 
shout and pursue godly things to do the will of God in every scenario that you live in. Would you stand with me this morning? And uh, I'm going to ask Jay if you'd come and help me as we, as we begin to close out. But this is a significant this is a significant passage for us this morning, and we're going to continue to pursue the wisdom that we find in 1 Samuel chapter 17 as we, be, as we begin to see what God is doing. And I hope that you will understand this passage to be less about David and Goliath and more about what God's doing. The commanding presence of God, the commanding presence of God's authority and leadership and the people that he puts in place around you, and even you, that you, would be a commanding presence so that you would stir the armies of God to arise and shout and to pursue. When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply Longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart And I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've made it When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus King of endless worth No one could express How much you deserve Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for things I've made it when it's all about you it's all about you Jesus it's all about you it's all about you it's all about you Jesus Pastor Jeremy gave us a a, a challenge this morning to, to be available in the moment to follow the right presence of God and to be that change that the, that the world needs to be able to see Christ's presence whether it's our home our jobs wherever we're at that we would be the people that usher in this presence of God with the people that we would meet as we close today I want to share this scripture that, that I found from Isaiah 41 verses 10 and 12 it says so do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. All who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. Those who oppose you will be nothing and they will perish. 
Though you search for your enemies, you will not find them. Those who wage war against you will be as nothing to you. Go in peace.